Hey everyone. Welcome to the very first episode of our podcast series on learning financial English. I'm Mateo, and I'm super excited to start this journey with all of you. And I'm Julia. Together, we'll be guiding you through the world of financial English, breaking down complex terms, explaining concepts, and helping you feel confident in using English for finance. So, Julia, why is financial English so important these days? That's a great question, Matteo. Financial English is a specialized branch of English that's used in the business and finance sectors, think banking, investments, accounting, and so on. In today's global economy, businesses from different countries interact constantly. Whether you're working in an international company, negotiating deals, or managing finances, being able to communicate effectively in English, specifically in financial contexts, has become essential. Exactly. Even if you're not working directly in finance, chances are you'll come across financial reports, contracts, or economic discussions in English. Knowing the right vocabulary and concepts can help you avoid misunderstandings and make you more professional. And that's where this podcast comes in. We'll cover everything from basic terminology to more advanced concepts, so by the end of this series, you'll be speaking the language of finance like a pro. We're keeping it practical and conversational too, so whether you're new to financial English or looking to sharpen your skills, you're in the right place. All right, let's get started. Okay, Julia, so for those who might be new to this, can you tell us, what exactly is financial English? Sure, Matteo. Financial English refers to the specific language and terminology used in the financial sector. It's a specialized form of English that focuses on words, phrases, and concepts you'll encounter in areas like banking, investing, accounting, and economics. Right, so it's not just general English with some finance words thrown in. It's its own thing. Exactly. Financial English has a very distinct vocabulary that is often technical. For example, in everyday English, you might use words like money or cost, but in financial English, you'll encounter terms like revenue, capital, liabilities, and equity. Each of these terms has a precise meaning in a financial context that's important for anyone working in the field to understand. That makes sense. So why is it so important for someone in the finance world to learn this specific type of English? Well, in finance, accuracy is everything. If you're dealing with international clients or working in multinational companies, you need to be able to communicate financial information clearly and accurately. Misunderstanding a term can lead to huge mistakes. For instance, confusing revenue with profit could give someone a completely wrong idea about how successful a business is. I see, so learning financial English isn't just about understanding more complex words, it's about being precise in communication. Absolutely. In the finance world, you often need to interpret data, write reports, or engage in negotiations. The stakes are high, and if you aren't fluent in the terminology, it could lead to costly errors. Plus, it shows professionalism. Imagine you're in a business meeting, and everyone's using these terms, you wouldn't want to be the person asking, wait, what's a liability? Huh, no, definitely not. And it's not just about avoiding mistakes. Having a strong command of financial English also opens up more opportunities. It allows you to participate in global markets, work with international clients, and understand financial news from around the world. That's a great point. I suppose if someone wants to work in finance on an international level, mastering financial English is really essential. Exactly. It's become the global standard in finance. Whether you're in New York, London, or Tokyo, financial English is the common language. And by learning it, you're not just improving your English, you're becoming a more valuable player in the global economy. Well said. So now that we've explained what financial English is and why it's important, let's dive into some of the basic terms, shall we? Alright, 
Now that we understand what financial English is, let's jump into some of the basic terms that everyone should know. We'll start with a few common ones like assets, liabilities, revenue, expenses, and profit. These terms form the foundation of most financial conversations. So, Julia, can you help us break these down? Of course. Let's start with one of the most fundamental concepts, assets. In financial English, an asset is something that a company or an individual owns that has value. It can be anything from cash in the bank, to property, to equipment, or even investments like stocks. The key is that assets are things you can use to generate more value. So, could we say my laptop is an asset? Yes. If you use your laptop for work and it helps you earn money, it's considered an asset. For a company, assets might include things like real estate, machinery, or intellectual property, anything that contributes to the company's financial success. Got it. So assets are things that add value to your life or business. What about liabilities? Good question. Liabilities are the opposite of assets. They represent what you owe. In other words, liabilities are debts or obligations. For instance, if you take out a loan to buy a car, the loan is your liability. In a business, liabilities might include loans, mortgages, or even unpaid bills. Ah, so if a company borrows money from a bank to buy equipment, the equipment is the asset, but the loan they took is the liability? Exactly. It's all about balancing what you own assets with what you owe liabilities. A healthy financial situation is one where assets outweigh liabilities. Now, let's move on to revenue. Revenue is a term we hear a lot in business. It refers to the total income a company generates from selling its products or services. So if a company sells phones, the money they make from selling those phones is their revenue. It's also sometimes called sales or turnover. So revenue is just all the money that comes in from selling something? Exactly. It's the top line of a company's income statement, often referred to as the a gross amount of money before any expenses are deducted. This brings us to the next term, expenses. Now, expenses are the costs a business incurs to keep running. This includes things like salaries, rent, utilities, and materials. In personal finance, your expenses would include things like groceries, rent, and transportation. Essentially, anything you pay for is an expense. So, a company has to balance its revenue, what it earns, with its expenses, right? Exactly. If a company's expenses are higher than its revenue, it's losing money. But if its revenue is higher, it's making a profit. And that brings us to our final term for today, profit. Profit is what's left over after you subtract your expenses from your revenue. In simple terms, it's the money a company or individual earns after all costs are covered. For example, if a company sells $100,000 worth of products, that's the revenue, and its expenses are $80,000, then the profit is $20,000. Ah, so profit is really the bottom line, it's what's left after you've paid for everything. Exactly. In financial English, you'll hear terms like net profit, which refers to the final amount after all taxes and deductions have been made. A business's goal is typically to maximize its profit while keeping expenses under control. All right, so to recap, assets are what you own, liabilities are what you owe, revenue is the income you generate, expenses are what you spend, and profit is what's left after you subtract expenses from revenue. That's the basics, right? Perfect! Those five terms are key in financial English, and you'll hear them in almost every financial discussion. Understanding these basics will make it much easier to grasp more advanced topics later on. Thanks, Julia. This has been super helpful. Let's keep building from here. All right, Julia, 
we've gone over the basic financial terms like assets, liabilities, revenue, expenses, and profit. But how do these terms actually show up in real-world conversations? Could you give us some examples of how they're used? Sure, Matteo. Let's imagine we're in two common situations, one in a business meeting and another in a job interview. I'll show you how these terms come up in natural conversation. Let's say we're in a business meeting discussing the company's financial health. I'll start the conversation as the CFO, and you can play the role of a team member trying to understand the company's performance. Good morning, everyone. As we review the company's performance for the quarter, I'd like to start by discussing our revenue. We generated $500,000 in sales this quarter, which is a 10% increase compared to last quarter. That's great news. But how does that revenue compare to our expenses? Good question. Our total expenses for the quarter were $350,000. That includes operational costs, salaries, and marketing efforts. After deducting these expenses from our revenue, we're left with a profit of $150,000. So our profit margin is improving. What about our assets? Are we still planning to invest in new equipment? Yes, we are. We've allocated $50,000 from our assets, specifically from our cash reserves, to invest in the new equipment. This investment should increase productivity and, ultimately, our future revenue. Sounds promising. And how are our liabilities looking? Currently, our liabilities stand at $200,000, which includes a loan we took out last year. We're in a good position to pay this off over the next two years as we continue to grow. Got it. So, in summary, our assets are being strategically invested, our liabilities are manageable, and we're seeing a healthy profit margin. In this business meeting example, you can see how each of these terms comes up naturally when discussing financial performance. The terms revenue, expenses, profit, assets, and liabilities are key to understanding and communicating the financial health of a company. Now, let's switch gears and look at how these terms might come up in a job interview, especially for a position in finance. I'll be the interviewer, and you can be the candidate. Thanks for coming in today, Matteo. In this role, you'll be responsible for managing the company's financial reports. Can you tell me how you would explain the difference between assets and liabilities to someone who's new to finance? Certainly. Assets are things that a company owns that have value, like cash, property, or equipment. Liabilities, on the other hand, are what the company owes, such as loans or unpaid bills. Essentially, assets bring value, while liabilities represent obligations. Great explanation. Now, let's say the company's expenses are rising faster than its revenue. How would you approach solving this issue? If expenses are increasing faster than revenue, the first step is to identify where the extra costs are coming from. Are we spending more on salaries, materials, or marketing? Once we understand that, we can look for ways to cut unnecessary expenses or increase revenue by boosting sales. That's a solid strategy. Finally, how would you ensure that the company continues to make a profit while managing both assets and liabilities effectively? To maintain profit, it's important to carefully manage both assets and liabilities. On the one hand, we need to use assets efficiently to generate more revenue. On the other hand, we have to ensure that liabilities, such as debts, don't outweigh the value of our assets. Regularly reviewing financial reports would help keep everything balanced. In this interview scenario, you see how the candidate used terms like assets, liabilities, expenses, revenue, and profit in a practical context. These are common questions in finance-related interviews, and being able to explain these concepts clearly shows your expertise. Those are some really helpful examples, Julia. I can see how these terms come up in different settings, whether you're working at a company or applying for a job in finance. 
Exactly. The more comfortable you get using these terms in conversation, the more confident you'll feel in professional financial settings. And remember, it's not just about knowing the definitions, it's about being able to explain and apply them in real-life situations. All right, Julia, we've covered a lot so far, basic financial terms, how they're used in conversations, and how to apply them in business settings. But I imagine people, especially non-native speakers like myself, make mistakes when learning financial English. What are some common errors that you've noticed? You're absolutely right, Matteo. Even though the terms we've discussed may seem straightforward, there are some frequent mistakes that learners tend to make when using financial English. I'll go over a few, and I'd love for you to jump in and share your experiences or tips on how you avoid these errors. One of the most common mistakes I see is people confusing revenue with profit. Some learners think they're the same thing, but they're not. Revenue is the total amount of money a company earns from sales before any expenses are deducted. Profit, on the other hand, is what's left over after expenses are subtracted from revenue. So, you can have high revenue but low profit if your expenses are too high. I've made that mistake myself. Early on, I thought the more revenue a company made, the more profitable it was. But then I learned that even if a company earns a lot of revenue, it could still be in financial trouble if its expenses are huge. A tip that helped me was to always think of profit as what's left after everything is paid for and revenue as just the raw income. Exactly. Keeping that distinction clear is key, especially in financial discussions. Another mistake is misunderstanding the difference between assets and liabilities. Sometimes people think that any financial term related to money or value is automatically an asset. But we've already talked about how liabilities represent what you owe, while assets are what you own. Mixing these up can lead to confusion, especially in financial reports. Yes, I remember struggling with this. I used to call everything I owned an asset without considering its financial significance. For example, I thought a car was always an asset, but I didn't account for the loan I took to buy it. It wasn't until I realized that liabilities like loans also play a big role in determining net worth that things became clearer. That's a great point. An easy way to avoid this mistake is to remember that assets bring value, while liabilities take value away in the form of obligations. A more subtle mistake has to do with verb tense, especially when learners are discussing financial performance over time. It's important to use the correct verb tense when talking about past, present, or future financial events. For instance, when discussing last quarter's revenue, you should say, our revenue was $100,000, not our revenue is $100,000. Mixing up tenses can confuse listeners, making it unclear whether you're talking about past performance or current results. I've definitely made that mistake, especially when I first started learning. I'd often say, the company is profitable last year, when I should have said, the company was profitable last year. One way I've avoided this mistake is by thinking carefully about when the financial event happened. If it's in the past, I always use past tense verbs like was or had. That's a great strategy, Matteo. It's all about clarity. Using the right tense helps ensure your audience understands when the financial events took place. Another frequent mistake involves the incorrect use of prepositions in financial phrases. Prepositions like in, on, at, and for can be tricky. For example, learners might say, we invested at a new project, instead of we invested in a new project. Or they might say, we had a profit on $50,000, when they should say, we had a profit of $50,000. Prepositions can change the meaning of a sentence entirely. Prepositions are definitely a challenge, especially since they don't always translate directly from my native language. One thing that helped me is practicing specific phrases, like, invest in, or, profit of. After repeating these correct phrases a few times, they became more natural. 
I also started paying attention to how prepositions are used in financial news or articles. That's a smart approach. Learning prepositions as part of a phrase rather than as individual words is a great way to avoid mistakes. Lastly, one mistake learners make is not recognizing when financial jargon is being used. Financial English often includes specialized terms like equity, dividends, or amortization, which aren't common in everyday English. Sometimes learners try to guess the meaning based on context, but this can lead to misunderstandings. It's always better to ask for clarification if you're unsure about a term. That's a great point. I've been in meetings where someone used the term EBITDA, and I had no idea what it meant. Instead of pretending to understand, I asked for clarification. It turned out to be an important financial metric, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Asking for clarification really saved me from making a bigger mistake. Exactly. Financial jargon can be overwhelming, so it's always better to ask and learn rather than assume. No one expects you to know every term right away, especially if you're still learning. Thanks for walking us through those common mistakes, Julia. As a non-native speaker, I can definitely relate to a lot of them. I've learned that slowing down, practicing, and asking questions are key to avoiding these errors. Absolutely, Matteo. Learning financial English is a process, and making mistakes is part of that process. But by being aware of these common errors and taking the time to correct them, learners can significantly improve their confidence and accuracy in using financial English. Wow, Julia. This has been such an insightful conversation. We've covered a lot of ground today, from understanding basic financial terminology to exploring common mistakes that people, like myself, often make when learning financial English. I think our listeners will find this really helpful. I hope so. It's always exciting to break down these concepts and make them accessible for everyone. Financial English can seem intimidating at first, but with the right guidance and practice, it but with the right guidance and practice, it becomes much more manageable. The key is to stay consistent and always look for ways to improve. Absolutely. I can tell that even though I've learned a lot today, there's still so much more to cover. And speaking of that, Julia, what can our listeners expect in the next episode? Great question. In our next episode, we'll dive deeper into financial documents and reports. We'll go over things like balance sheets, income statements, and cash flow statements. We'll explain how to read and interpret them and discuss the kind of vocabulary you need to navigate these documents confidently. That sounds incredibly useful. I know understanding financial documents can be one of the trickiest parts of learning financial English, so I'm sure our listeners will get a lot out of it. Exactly. We'll be simplifying these documents so that even those who are new to financial English can follow along. Plus, we'll provide some practical examples of how these documents are used in real business scenarios. I'm looking forward to that. So, to our listeners, make sure you join us for the next episode, where we'll continue our journey into financial English. Whether you're a beginner or just looking to polish your skills, you won't want to miss it. And don't forget, if you have any questions or suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover, feel free to reach out. We love hearing from you and tailoring our episodes to what will benefit you the most. Yes, absolutely. Your feedback helps shape this podcast, so let us know what you'd like to hear next. Thanks again for tuning in today, and we'll see you in the next episode. Until then, keep practicing, keep learning, and take care.